Sports. I'm your host, Zach Romero. Today's film we're going to be discussing is part of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series. Now, it can be easily argued that the Texas Chainsaw Massacre film is one of the most influential horror films of the 1970s, if not of all time. And a lot of that comes from the fact that it was such a front-runner in terms of blurring the lines between reality and fantasy. Keep in mind that prior to this horror landmark, monsters in movies were literally monsters. As in the villains would be something clearly supernatural or some kind of ridiculous, made-up, thinly-veiled propaganda. Like, oh no, it's a giant wasp lady, run! Also, women can never be equal to a man, it's gonna... But Texas Chainsaw Massacre was different. Like, you genuinely believe that these backwoods inbreds were capable of these heinous acts. So the series revolves around Leatherface, an incestuous monster of a man with a passion for cross-dressing and a gift for hacking up teenagers with a chainsaw. His family of cannibals lure lonesome souls into their lair, tortures them, slaughters them, and in many cases, eats them. The film series varies to some extent, but ultimately boils down to one f***ed up family in Texas doing the devil's work. Part of what adds to the mystique of these films are the casts that are in them. Every one of these films tend to cast relatively unknown actors, like the biggest star power was Dennis Hopper in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. So you don't get the reassurance of, well this can't be real because Rock Hudson's in it, I know he plays other characters in films. It's more like, oh god, what if this is real and these people are actually hicks with some kind of stuff film? So with all of that said, the film we'll be looking at today is the 1994 reboot of the series. <laughs> Starring Matthew McConaughey and Renee Zellweger. Wait a minute, what? Yeah, both actors in the starts of their career agreed to do this film for exposure, and I'm sure they don't regret that decision in any way, shape, or form. So, the film starts with an obnoxious 90s prom, where through an unfortunate car accident, three as-good-as-dead teens end up lost in the woods. The entire first act is just these characters we know little to nothing about, just kind of wandering around. After about seven centuries of this, two of the teens find a creepy old house, and we start to see some interesting villains. We have your standard exaggerated hicks, and of course the franchise mascot Leatherface. The kids all get grabbed, murdered, beaten, etc., and this whole part of the town seems to be in on it. The cops don't ask questions, the awkward real estate skank is on board, even the friendly neighborhood tow truck driver is a crazed murderer. He's dead now. Well, I don't even think about running off down that road. It ain't gonna do you damn bit good, I can tell you that right now. What are you gonna do? Well, first, I'm gonna kill you. It ain't no f***ing biggie. So, Renee Zellweger breaks free of the family of psychos, but unfortunately gets captured again. I mean, uh, what can you expect to have her outnumbered? Oh, no, wait, wait, wait! She's out! She's out! Nope! Nope, they got her again. Wow, is she ever gonna- Holy sh She's free! Nope! Nope, just kidding, they got her again. Yep, yeah, they got her. You know, it's really difficult to keep the fear and the adrenaline up when you just keep going back and doing the same thing over and over again. I mean, you can only go back to the well so many times before it stops being affected. I'm not kidding. Like, this movie seriously pulls this swerve, like, 20 different times. It's, it's, it's very obnoxious. So it's pretty clear that Matthew McConaughey pretty much runs away with this film. I mean, every scene that he's in, he's got the subtlety of the fucking Kool-Aid man. Give a count to ten, give me a reason why I shouldn't. Nine, eight. What? Don't be late. Oh, oh. The only thing that really distracts me from his performance is his accent. You see, he still has the same, all right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right. The southern twang is cranked way up, and the intensity is definitely there. So, the plot breaks down as such. 25 minutes of Renee Zellweger and her goobery friends wandering around lost, then 12 minutes of getting chased by scary hicks, then 44 minutes of yelling and torturing Renee Zellweger, and 14 minutes of whatever hot garbage they could throw at the camera to try to come up with a decent ending. Ultimately, here's the film's biggest problem. It doesn't know what the fuck it wants to do. It's a completely different idea. In fact, if the movie was really true to itself, it would actually be called Jesus. Matthew McConaughey is fucking crazy. Not, hey, we're trying to do TCM again. Nevertheless, I want to go over the three factors that really, really stop this film from bringing new attention to this franchise. First, Leatherface isn't Leatherface in this. You see, of all the slasher icons, Leatherface is given the least amount of human characterization, and as such, leaves him as one of the most mysterious of them all. He appears to have a butcher's background, having a large apron and the utensils, but also the fact that he wears the skin of his victims, the fact he's okay with cross-dressing. There's a lot that we don't get answers to. He's terrifying, and the fact that he's backed by this crazed family of cannibals puts him in a whole nother classification. In this, however, he's reduced to nothing but a henchman. 
squealing, squawking, wailing like a goddamn banshee, punching bag, whose role is to pick up people and move them into other locations and then trot around with a chainsaw. However, he hesitates too much to actually use it. Second of all, the movie's all about Matthew McConaughey's character. We learn next to nothing about any other family members. All we learn about is Vilmer. His scenes railroad two-thirds of the film. All the characters don't speak unless spoken to by him, and we just continuously check in with how he's doing or how he feels about something, even when the action doesn't involve him at all. It's like they had the movie laid out, and then when McConaughey got the role, they went, Well, fuck all that. This guy is where the money is at. And finally, the real reason why this reboot and several of the other attempts never really worked or brought on the same kind of power or made the same kind of money that the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre did is because it's a different time. Suspension of disbelief is dead. You see, when the original film came out back in 74, the marketing campaign was, This really happened. What happened was true. So audiences sat there going, Real life? Oh, f this is based on a true story. Oh, dude. No. No, we're not going to Texas this summer. F that. Nowadays, we're too jaded. We're, we have access to information too quickly. So we never believe anything at face value. So now audiences are like, uh, pff, Based on a true story, that dolphin had a tail. Now I know this particular review has been a little bit cerebral, so I wanted to take a moment to just speak from emotions real quick. Now, Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Next Generation is a reboot of the franchise. Reboot coming from the same root word as remake. Which means that at some point in this film there were going to be certain homages to the original. It's to be expected. However, the most egregious example of this comes at the very end of this thing. Now, the end of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre has a moment that sets its villain apart from many others in the slasher genre. The survivor girl gets away, but the monster is still alive to be pissed off about it. Allow me to elaborate, and uh, I guess spoilers on a 30-year-old film, but uh, nevertheless. In the big slasher films, the villain or monster is usually killed by the end of it and either reappears in the next one with some kind of bullshit explanation or appears at the very end as a very cheap jump scare. However, in this case, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a different breed. Leatherface, this murderous thing who's nearly diced this poor woman up, is stuck there in the Texas summer heat to stew in his own failure. His reaction to this is to throw a childish fit, flinging around the only tool he has, his chainsaw. This scene actually came about organically, as on set, Gunnar Hansen, the stuntman who played Leatherface in the first one, was the only person who could lug this damn chainsaw around. So when given free reign to express frustration at the end of the scene, he came up with this glorified rage spasm. It's an amazing little moment, and unlike anything moviegoers had seen before. The moment was later deemed the Chainsaw Jig by fans that had developed from the cult status of this film. It's, it's sort of like, uh, like in, in, in the Hellraiser movies. In the first one, Pinhead isn't called Pinhead. He's called Leader of Cenobite Hellspawn Eater of Souls, or whatever Clive Barker scribbled into a napkin. But sometimes fans of certain series come up with nicknames and they actually stick. So needless to say, the moment in the original movie, fucking amazing. The moment that is recycled in the reboot is an insult. Renee Zellweger gets away for the 15th time, Leatherface in hot pursuit. She gets away, and then she's in a hospital talking to the police chief, and then, oh my god, she sees the lady who was the survivor from the original movie, but they don't actually mention that, they just kind of keep the frame on there, so if you don't know that she's the original survivor woman, you're just kind of like, oh, okay, why are we staring at this person? Is that Renee Zellweger's mom? I don't understand what's going on. So the shitty movie is wrapping up, and then suddenly we just segue back to Leatherface dancing outside, and I mean literally dancing. Oh, so now suddenly Leatherface is important enough for a scene. He's not just somebody's goddamn henchman now. Oh, okay. I think the only reason why they included this scene in the movie is because they couldn't figure out how to get Matthew McConaughey to do that same dance with all the robotic shit on his leg. In short, the success and the terror of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre 
can never be recreated. The, the shadow of its greatness reaches too far. It would be near impossible to hit all the same notes with the same precision as the one that started it. Next Generation takes far too many missteps to even come close. This particular example isn't one of spitting in the face of the franchise, but it's a completely different film with an unjust title on it. That's it for this episode of Horrible Horrors Halloween Havoc. I'm Zach Romero. Until next time. Thank you.